Um, thanks very much for being here. And I uh, will introduce uh, these panelists in a moment, but I want to tell you a peculiar thing about this session. Uh, we have, in addition uh, to these two, uh, two other panelists uh, who are coming, Robert Spano and uh, Cynthia Ye. Uh, they are involved in a rehearsal for the music festival uh, right now. And the question was, was I willing to cut the rehearsal short to have them here on time? And I said, absolutely not. They have, they have work to do. Um, so they will be coming in about midway through the session. Because of that, I thought what we might do, uh, if, it, if it seems as though you are going to have questions and comments, that we might bring those into the middle of the session. And then uh, Robert and Cynthia will come and, and, uh, and give us some of their insights. Um, we do begin uh, with one of the great Renaissance scholars of our time. Uh, Don Randall is also the editor of the Harvard Dictionary of Music and, and thus uh, an extraordinarily influential musicologist. Um, but that's not all. Uh, he has also served as provost of Cornell University, as president of the University of Chicago, and as president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, uh, of which he has recently become president emeritus. Um, and in that role, is therefore one of the most important funders of classical music in America in, in recent times. Um, also with us is David Halen. David is a member of our faculty here at the Aspen Music Festival and School. He is the concertmaster of the St. Louis Symphony. He is professor of violin at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and also at Bobby McDuffie's Center for Strings at Mercer University in Georgia, and also organizes his own music festival. Um, so, um, then when they come, we will have Robert Spano, who is music director of the Aspen Music Festival in School, also music director of the Atlanta Symphony, uh, also an extraordinarily distinguished uh, pianist and composer. Uh, and Cynthia Ye, who is the principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony. Now our topic is, what's an orchestra to do, uh, the orchestra in the 21st century? And the organizers of this year's Aspen Ideas Festival have asked many uh, presenters to think 10 years out. This is the 10th anniversary of the Ideas Festival itself. And so we are to uh, think about trends, challenges, opportunities over the next 10 years. But I think in the orchestra world, uh, we would do well uh, to start today and thinking about what is happening in our world of American orchestras today uh, as we then move into thinking about what trends uh, might be discernible. So I'm thinking, what is working? Uh, what is great about the orchestra world in the US today? What is completely not working? Or some places not working? Um, and in fact, I'm going to uh, try to direct Don a little bit uh, to start this off by saying how diverse this world is and how unlike uh, one orchestra's uh, outlook may be from another. It's very hard to generalize, and one should be leery of generalizing about orchestras, because every orchestra lives in some particular place. And for one orchestra to say, well, this is what they're doing over in St. Louis or in San Francisco, let's do that too, can often lead to trouble. So every orchestra needs to find out what its community is about and what kind of music it can make uh, in that community. I mean, the one thing that should guide us all in this discussion is that we have the greatest orchestras in the world. And they are making music at the highest possible level. And that's something we don't want to give up on. So everything has to be loyal to that underlying value. How you bring that about in any given case uh, is bound to vary somewhat with local circumstances. But there are a few things you can say about these institutions generally. Uh, and they are things that orchestras have in common with higher education, uh, with conservatories of music, and so forth. And that is they suffer from what economists have for a long time called the cost disease. That is to say, it's very hard to make productivity gains. So in some companies that we could name, the way you get ahead and remain more and more profitable is by firing people sometimes by the thousands. Well, you know all of the jokes about orchestras and string quartets. You can't achieve productivity gains by saying, 
as your McKinsey guy comes in and says, well, you know, the second violins play many more notes per evening than the first oboists, so the secret is to fire the oboists and hire more second violins, right? Or string quartet will get rid of one guy and we'll cut our costs by 25%. Um, so we, we have a relationship to the past and Beethoven still has us by the short hairs if what we want to do is play his music. Uh, and that means if you want to know where we're going to be in 10 years, thinking carefully about how will one manage the fact that costs inevitably will go up faster than inflation and that revenue from ticket prices can't probably go up faster than inflation because we all know what ticket prices are becoming. So what's the revenue that's going to close that gap for us? And philanthropy, philanthropy is a big part of it, but not the only part of it. Well, so let's stay with philanthropy because um, we are primarily, uh, in the world of American orchestras, we are primarily funded by philanthropy. Um, uh, there's earned income from ticket sales. Um, uh, to take a quick detour, some of the orchestras that are doing best financially, uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Boston Symphony, uh, are actually earning much of that money in a secondary stream of activity. Uh, at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, in Tanglewood, where there's a lot of pops programming, uh, in the Boston Pops itself. Um, so ticket sales, generally speaking, for an American orchestra uh, are not going to even nearly cover costs. Uh, thus, uh, the Metropolitan Opera uh, revealed some figures recently uh, that uh, contributed income is a, about 50% of their budget. So one question is, is that sustainable? Ten years from now, are we still going to be happy with that model? Uh, that's a problem in our current circumstance because the major foundations, for example, with the exception of Mellon, have essentially abandoned arts and culture. Uh, a number of foundations, Ford, Rockefeller, you name it, had major programs in the arts at one time and major programs in support of symphony orchestras, precisely. And Mellon is the only foundation of any size that has a significant commitment to orchestras. The result is that with that sector having declined, where is new philanthropy going to come from? And it's not that there isn't sufficient wealth in society, you'll agree. The question is how do we get a lot of newly or relatively newly wealthy people with truly vast resources interested in supporting cultural institutions in the way that Andrew Mellon and people of that generation did. So David, what is the, the feeling for you in a particular city uh, where you've been for quite a number of years? Uh, surely you know all the philanthropists in the city. I do. And, um, for me, it's been really an interesting journey because uh, uh, watching the orchestra go from, we, we had re re reached a very high degree of, I say, notoriety around the world and tours and recordings under Leonard Slack in, in the 80s and early 90s. And, um, but then come to find that we were severely undercapitalized, uh, particularly in the area of endowment. And we, we kept trying to grow our annual fund uh, to compensate, and it just became unsustainable. So we developed a 10-year plan, and it was about 10 years ago, actually, mm -hmm. that we put it into place. Um, and now we're at a point where we have, I, I think if you took a pie chart, I'd say a third of our resources come from ticket sales, a third from annual fund, and a third now from endowment. And that was very difficult to achieve because you, want, you end up cannibalizing your annual fund when you need to raise endowment, and, or vice versa. So, um, I, but I've, I've watched the orchestra evolve into that, and, and I think it's very, relatively speaking, very healthy today. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, we went through a lot of what you're seeing in other institutions uh, today, we went through a long time ago. And so, I, I mean, I have my own set of, of, of answers of what we need to be as an, an orchestra 10 years from now. But, but I think that what was said earlier is that it really is going to be different for every community. We, we cannot be the New York Philharmonic. We cannot do what they do. We, don't, we can't play as many concerts and have people come to those concerts as the New York Philharmonic because our population base is so much smaller. But what we can do is we can be a resource for the community and, and basically a catalyst for cultural activity. And that, that's what I think is what we're really striving to be as, as, a, as an institution in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. 
Just a, a curious fact that comes to my mind is, by and large, most of the symphony halls in American cities are about the same size, and yet the cities are radically different sizes. And uh, so, I'm not sure. yeah, ours is 2,700 seats, which back in the 19, uh, 1916, when it was built, was considered normal. Uh, of course, it was a vaudeville theater. It was conceived as a vaudeville theater. But the movie theater down the street, built in 1929, has 5,000 seats in it. And that the Fox Theater, and there, so that most of that's before the, the, the great days of home entertainment and TV and all that. But uh, we, we have a difficult time selling 2,700 seats on any given night. And uh, we can do that maybe a dozen times a year, but most of the time we're, around, we're at around 2,000 to 200 if, we're consider, if it's considered a success. Another thing that bears on this, of course, is what kind of music will the orchestra play? And what's the repertory that can both sell tickets and maintain the commitment to the great tradition of orchestral music and to continuing that tradition into the future? And so there's a great temptation to, you might say, dilute somewhat the standard repertory in order to reach a broader audience. So more pop concerts and more concerts with other kinds of projections of films or, or what have you. And a serious nervousness in many quarters about any music composed since 1913. I mean, we, we have a lot of people in the audience who say they really can't stand this modern music, which is now 100 years old, <laughs> some of it, uh, mm -hmm. when in fact, if they uh, would open their ears to it a bit, would probably like some current contemporary music a lot better than they might like some of the music from the 1920s, let us say. Well, let's talk about the concert experience. Um, I'll make one other comment on funding, uh, which is that uh, this week the German government announced its current budget for the support of the arts in Germany, and it's 1.3 some billion dollars. Uh, would, and in, in the entire US, which is of course a much larger country, it's much less than 10% uh, of, of that. Um, and we might come to some trends in, in government funding in a moment. But Don talks about the concert format because it's not only whether or not we have music by living composers, whether or not we have great 20th century modernist works, um, but it's also, is the concert about two hours long or is the concert about 45 minutes long? Um, do people talk in the concert or do they absolutely not talk in the concert? Uh, a very important writer on the arts, Manuela Holterhoff, uh, formerly of the Wall Street Journal, uh, now at Bloomberg, has proposed that uh, there be people in the aisles of the Metropolitan Opera selling popcorn and, and beer, uh, and that people would have a much better experience of the opera if, uh, well, I won't go any further with that. Um, but she said it. Um, David, do you have any comments about, uh, as a leader of the orchestra among the players, um, about the programming and about the format of the concert? Well, I would say that in musicians, um, I always think, are, are the worst critics. They are, they are the most critical of, of playing new works because, first of all, it's extremely challenging in some cases. And so um, they want, and I just, from my, people that, have, that know the standard repertoire already, they, it's very easy to go in and play a two-hour concert of all favorites, war horse favorites that, that we play all the time. Yet, if we're going to play a piece of Allen's, we actually have to actually do a lot of homework okay. beforehand. And so, you know, the tip, since many people look at it, it's, yes, it's an art, but it's also a job. And, um, and, they're, and they are often spread very thin because they, they, people like me, I like to moonlight. I like to play concerts other places and do other things at the same time. So they're sometimes a little jaded. But on the other hand, um, for example, there was a period in St. Louis where we did extremely conservative programming. And I found, I actually looked forward, one of the reasons we appointed David Robertson was to bring a more eclectic mix into our programming and to, and to keep us from becoming a stodgy old arts institution that, that basically it's like having an, an art museum that never changes the exhibitions, you know. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just the same old stuff all the time. What about the question of what the orchestra wears when it plays. It's very controversial, and I, I mean, I have my own opinion, which is that I think we are severely 
to be honest, underdressed in terms of, uh, I mean, I think that the tradition of wearing tails and, at a concert is a wonderful tradition. And I would fight vehemently against changing that. Because when you deformalize the, and especially because in our hall it's very opulent, it's, it's, it's got gold leaf everywhere, it's beautiful, it looks like the Palace of Versailles. Um, it would look silly for us to be in there in, in t-shirts black t-shirts and black pants, and it does, and we occasionally do that, and it just looks terrible. And the, but the biggest dilemma we have is for, for what, what do you do, uh, the women in the orchestra do? And there's, there's constant controversy because you can't necessarily legislate what they're supposed to wear, but and then there's, my, my colleagues are constantly fighting amongst each other or telling the personnel manager, well, so-and-so is wearing something that, where their, elbow or this, their, if their elbows are showing and there's something in our contract that says it has to be below the elbow and, mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to wear rhinestones and somebody comes in with something that glitters and we just don't know what to do with it. It's, <laughs> we have a problem there and we have not solved it and I don't think any orchestra has actually. Okay. Well, Yvonne Fisher, who's been a guest here in Aspen uh, and has the Budapest Festival Orchestra, uh, does midnight concerts with beanbag chairs spread among the players in the orchestra so the audience is invited to come up and just lounge and be on the floor? How do you feel, I guess? Well, in our hall it wouldn't work, but, <laughs> but we could do it somewhere else. And, and actually, that's where it goes back to, I think every orchestra will find its own answer. Um, we, uh, uh, Detroit Symphony, for example, is doing a lot of satellite venue concerts that are, that are successful, that are selling out. We don't do that in St. Louis, and the, so far our studies have not shown that, us that that would be successful. Hmm. And um, so in, in Detroit, you would think Detroit and St. Louis would be comparable. Well, there's certainly boards uh, of some orchestras that are very conservative about programming and are pressuring the artistic side um, to stick with Beethoven and Dvorak, but do you have any observations about how that works? Well, once again, it depends a lot on the local community, depends on the music director. I think orchestras and comparable cultural organizations have a responsibility to, let's call it educate and to lead, not only to be the mere entertainment which serious people turn to after the real work of the day is done. It's hard to imagine somebody who claimed to be interested in the theater, hard to imagine such a person saying, you know what, I only want to see plays that I've already seen. <laughs> or somebody who's serious about going to movies saying, I only want to see movies I've already seen. Or somebody who is interested in contemporary art saying, I only want to see the paintings that I've already seen. <clears throat> well, alas, you have boards of trustees of some orchestras or some members of some boards of orchestras who have essentially that idea that they really only want to hear pieces they've already heard or might likely have heard. And then they add to that <coughs> a real fear of the financial consequences of putting on too much new or challenging music because it will drive the audience away. There's a real tension there and one can't lightly dismiss it. But the institution has, I think, a responsibility not only to the great tradition of the past and to keeping that alive and to explore parts of it that remain yet not terribly well explored, <clears throat> but also to lead and to educate. You ought to come away from a symphony orchestra concert stimulated, uh, feeling that you, in some sense, learn something. Uh, we have those same issues in all kinds of cultural institutions and in colleges and universities too. It ought to be in some sense challenging, a bracing experience. Mm. You know, I'll give you an example of a, um, in a couple of weeks here we're doing a, a festival orchestra concert where um, the first piece on the program is going to be this, is it Christopher Theophanidis? Is yeah. it? Uh, it's called Rainbow Body. And when I saw that program, um, I remember, I just recalled that when St. Louis, when we did that, we had an audience response that was overwhelming. It was so positive. They were cheering by the end of that piece. And that was the modern piece that, some, that a lot of people will try to, you know, come in a little late so they don't have to yeah. sit through it. And, there's, and sometimes it's, they're really surprised when they're challenged and with something that they really, really like. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just comment on one uh, atrocious recent development about uh, 
Productivity, uh, which is the Hartford, uh, Connecticut opera, proposed to stage Wagner's Ring Cycle uh, with a synthesized orchestra. So there would be live singers singing to a recorded uh, orchestra. Uh, I'm sure you followed that. I, I wouldn't go, but, <laughs> but I, I mean, and I don't think that um, that will happen anytime soon. I mean, it, it's, it would be the same thing as just having, just having mimics up or just people mime things on stage and play a recording. That, you could say that would be the next step. Hmm. But um, I, I think that's never going to really catch on, as it were, in, in, at least in serious art. Right. What, I mean, and they did withdraw the, the idea of, of doing it under some protest. Well, I think one of the dynamics at work here is, of course, tremendous pressure on costs and continuing to make the experience accessible to a broad segment of the public and not to let the arts become the property exclusively of the rich. <clears throat> but this is a problem we face in our country in many domains. It's the problem with higher education. It's the problem with health care, with many other things. Uh, the wealthy will always have these things to the extent that they want to, but you know, 50% of the country is 50% of the country, family of four is living on $50,000 a year or less. And so how many times a year does such a family with you know, two kids and so forth, how many times a year do you suppose they think that it would be a good idea to spend a couple of hundred dollars on the tickets and then whatever else the babysitter and the parking and so forth cost? I mean, how many times economically does that fit in the family budget? And then that's to say nothing of the bottom quarter, which is millions of people. So do you want them to have access to this kind of thing or don't you? That means we have to do what we have always done and different places have different ways of doing it. The well-to-do will support the activities of the less well-to-do. And you can do it in the German method through the tax code. You have a seriously progressive income tax and the government provides funding to these entities and tickets are cheap. Or university education is free because everybody's already paid for it to the extent of their ability through their taxes. Or you can do the way we do it here, namely leave this up to every last individual institution to figure out how to do it on their own. So colleges and universities have an announced tuition price but they expect only a relatively small fraction of people actually to pay that, and those people are subsidizing the less well-to-do. So a similar thing will happen uh, in concert halls, and it has been happening for a long time. You have high ticket prices, which you then discount for certain purposes and so forth. Now, we are joined by Robert Spano, music director of Atlanta Symphony and Aspen Music Festival and School, and Cynthia Ye, principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony. Uh, you're here early, which means you didn't rehearse as much as maybe you <laughs> ought to have done. <laughs> but we're going to oh. wire you up for mics. And uh, we are talking some about funding and some about uh, a stratification of support so that in, in the U.S. We, we expect that people who are able will, will contribute and that people who are less able uh, will be brought along. Uh, it makes me wonder about uh, a possibly related situation, which is the so-called graying of the audience. And uh, related to that uh, concern that uh, new generations of very wealthy people will no longer be inclined to follow in the tradition of their parents or grandparents, or maybe more pointedly, not their parents or grandparents because they have new wealth uh, from high tech, and they have no tradition of, of this kind of support. So that was a mouthful, but... As somebody who is already grayed, of course, I don't like people to speak ill of the gray audience. <laughs> <coughs> but more important than that is the fact that it's this gray audience, people like me who retired a year ago, who have both the leisure and the resources to go to cultural events. So we shouldn't be entirely dismayed that there are a lot of great people out there. We ought to go after them in a big way and recruit more and more. That means probably having concerts at 
five in the afternoon because <laughs> we don't stay up late on but it has to be after nap time but before bedtime. <laughs> um, simultaneously, of course, one does need to bring on a new audience and we struggle in this country with the fact that we now have several generations who have grown up in school systems where music has been eliminated. So lots of people did not grow up with music around them, making music, hearing music, being taken to concerts by their parents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a serious issue and is one of the reasons that many orchestras have outreach programs attempting to get into the schools and expose young people to this music. One further thought, I'm already talking, but yeah. <laughs> a further thought along those lines, I'm remembering a, a letter of Brahms complaining that music education has <coughs> shifted from making music to learning about it. And I've often felt that the most, well, and we know statistically, I believe, that most, uh, most people who attend concerts played something or sang as children. And so the, the notion I, I'm determined as a music director that our orchestra do everything it can to infiltrate the schools and to make music accessible to children but I don't think ultimately it can be as effective as children studying music. And mm -hmm. perhaps the most important thing is to change our educational system back to one that embraces art. Well, it, well lots of it starts in the cradle too. I mean, we, we need to have parents who, as the American Academy of Pediatrics learned just the other day, it's amazing it took them so long, urging that Babies should be read to from the moment of birth. I mean, what an idea. I mean, <laughs> that's so clear. They should also be sung to from the moment of birth and exposed to things. I mean, every baby is a born composer, artist, scientist, you name it. I mean, how soon do they bang on things just to see what it sounds like? Uh, and that's a, a spirit that needs to be nourished by parents and nourished when they get into school and after banging on certain kind of stuff then you give them instruments and things to if not bang on although some people bang on a lot of stuff for a living <laughs> uh, uh, it, it really needs to start in the cradle and part of the reason it's not starting in the cradle so much is that we have lots of parents now who didn't grow up with it themselves so in the grain of the audience, I uh, will say one scientific thing and then one non-scientific thing. Uh, the League of American Orchestras studies uh, average ages of subscribers. And in the past, say, 30, 40, 50 years, it's remarkably stable. Um, and it's, uh, the average subscriber to an orchestra is in her or his late 50s. Uh, it has gone from age 56 up to around age 58 now, I think. But the average life expectancy has gone up faster than that. So in effect, uh, we're getting way more older people, um, but something funny is happening because uh, there must be younger people coming in if those numbers are to be believed. Um, but my completely non-scientific uh, opinion is that uh, when a young person goes into a concert hall, uh, or attends some cultural function or even walks through a museum, um, they're very self-centered and they don't see old people. They just see people around, but uh, they're not evaluating. When that same person, uh, as has happened to me and, and to Don and to David, uh, when that same person becomes gray, all of a sudden the, the focus is very different and you're extremely aware of whether there are young people present or whether there are predominantly older people present. So it's a psychological shift that I think fuels the overwhelming perception that the audience is getting much, much grayer, even though the, the science, the statistics show us that it's not. It's about the same. I read an article a couple years ago from the 30s about the graying of the audience. Yep. <laughs> well, actually, our audience in the Chicago Symphony, we play a 1.30 Friday afternoon series, and that is like, that's the blue plate special. Yes. <laughs> and that's what we expect, and that's why the concert series was started. Um, but we actually do get a good number of young people on Friday evening, which is actually a newer series, mm -hmm. um, and Saturday evenings. And these are like, you can tell who they are 
that they're mostly first time concert goers. I don't know if it's even like a first date, but it's like to impress their partners. And it's just, you see these kids just all way too dressed up and you know they're making an event and a thing of it which is really cute to watch but i just wonder if they come back or if they're just kind of doing it but at least they're choosing the symphony as something to impress someone with uh -huh. which is really cute and we've started and our our orchestra has started this young people um board called like overture councils and we'll have they'll throw parties and i think buy-in is like a hundred dollar pledge and you have to I think buy like five concert tickets or five pairs of tickets and you go to these events and that little thing has grown from like 20 I think there's now like over 100 members and I think you just have to be between 25 and 45 they're considering 45 to be young now too yes uh, I think the Yale Younger Poets Award is under 50 something <laughs> like that um, so uh, I'd like to ask, especially our three uh, people engaged in performance with orchestras, um, about uh, aspects of the concert experience and digital media and other forms of media. So one idea is, uh, uh, David referred to the hall in St. Louis, which is absolutely gorgeous, and it's, it's a temple to art. It's a sanctuary. And, and so you get your clothes on, and the musicians put their clothes on, and uh, get all ready to go and sit in silence uh, for about two hours uh, and with certain specific behavior codes, of course, that, that need to be adhered to. Um, what if there is a multimedia layer added onto that concert? What if there is um, an interactive program on an iPad that you can choose to follow along the piece? What if there is a video game designed around Schumann's Second Symphony that you are playing while the piece happens? Um, I'm not making any of this stuff up, by the way. So um, I just want to ask, start with Cynthia. Oh, um, well, I feel like the formal concert hall experience, I feel like the younger people these days, the idea of being told what to do, what to wear, when not to cough, when not to talk, when not to check their phones is so foreign to them that it's like so many rules that they don't have to live by outside the concert hall. So it's like they're choosing to like feel like when they come to the concert hall and part of the reason why maybe they don't want to just that's how they want to spend their Friday night is why do that when they can be like texting while playing video games with their friends in their flip-flops, you know, like just being totally casual. And that's like all these rules that we have that I do sometimes wonder which part we would be okay giving up. Mm. But at the same time, it's a tradition. And if we don't keep it, who will? You know? And is it really too much to ask for someone to turn their phones off for two hours and sit there and listen to music? I think, Alan, you spoke so eloquently at our convocation about how this particular art form provides an opportunity to focus our attention and to get the rewards of sustained attention through listening and through following the, the dialectic or the narrative or the, the unfolding of the music. That that's, that's a human capacity we need as well as our capacity to multitask. And I personally think that the, the notion of introducing this other experience into an experience which actually is an invitation to active contemplation is a mistake. And if we are going to do it, we at least need to sequester them into some <laughs> ghetto <laughs> or where they can't be seen nor heard. And we can pipe the music into them because if they're that busy, then they don't need to be in the room. <laughs> or have really like, the, <laughs> like the special music night where you can do whatever you want night. Yeah. Because but I think part of the musical experience in a live musical e event is also the, I mean, we, we hear with our pores we don't only hear with our ears, we hear with our skin. We, we hear in a holistic and total way. And our experience in a hall, the hall is the instrument. And our experience in a hall is one of connectivity to the shared event of the unfolding of that music. And so I'm, 
I am an arch conservative in this debate. Well, as, as, as you know, I'm with you, but uh, with, with the following other possible point, what if the architecture of halls of the future, since we are supposed to be thinking a little about the future, what if the architecture of the halls accommodated that experience? So if you're in Carnegie Hall and you have an iPad and you're sitting in the middle of the stalls, if you will, and you're playing with it, you are going to disrupt the experience for every other person. But if you go to New World Symphony's new Frank Gehry Hall in Miami Beach, you can choose to be outside the hall in a setting where you wouldn't be disturbing anybody by doing that and play the Schumann II video game. Um, and so there is a sequestration. Yeah. But David. You know what, to me it's in interesting because um, I compare some, sometimes when going to a concert and is a little bit like um, the kind of contemplation that you, if you go to temple or you go to church, and, and it's one of the few times that you actually sit in a place and reflect and, or, and, and in a way meditate unless you do that at home. And that's kind of what happens at a concert hall. And I actually, I, because I'm, I usually play a concert on Saturday night and I was not raised in a super religious family, I didn't go for many years because I always tell people, listen, I, I worship at St. Mattress on Sunday morning <laughs> because I'm, I'm, you know, I've got to play a concert on Sunday afternoon too. But um, it is, there is something very beautiful about that experience and I would hate to give that up in a concert setting. And at the same time, my brother in Houston Symphony, they have a series of, of uh, concerts where they do have the video displays. I think they got a, a, a very large grant to do that. And they do a, num a significant number of their concerts with those screens, and they're um, they're very popular. With and it is a younger audience that goes to those concerts. So uh, I think that that it's there's once again we get into the thing where each orchestra needs to find their own answers. But I have a feeling there's going to be a little bit of all of the above, really. Well, there was a um, famous business school uh, case a number of years ago uh, involved, I think, Procter and Gamble. Uh, and some executive at Procter & Gamble had observed that 90% um, of people in America want higher suds uh, detergent, and everybody was making higher suds detergent. But this person said, then 10% want lower suds. So we should also have a product which is the lower suds detergent because that's what they want, and we can corner that market. So I think of us in our world as the lower suds people, because <laughs> people say, oh, young people don't want to concentrate, they don't want to do any of this stuff, they don't want to be formal, et cetera. But I'm thinking, well, what if some of them do? And what if those are the people who are candidates to come to our concerts? What is, don't you think part of it is um, the whole idea of being told what to do mm -hmm. with the young people these days? It's just being told that they should do this and you know they'll run the other way. Yeah. So I don't know how you even introduce music or just having, you know, instead of classical music only ever on, you know, the public radio stations, what if it was on XM and it's not labeled classical station? It is mixed in with other things that people all of a sudden, you know, people aren't going to turn it off. If you kind of introduce it a little bit at a time, you'll catch their ear. If it's kind of more mixed, you know, music where they're, because kids, kids these days, they, they're constantly listening to music. So it's like, well, shoot, if you just sneak one, one in there once a day, you know, like once an hour, eventually, it's basically this language that they're so foreign to. So to the point where they, it's like when they see the word classical, they think it's like bad mushed Brussels sprouts. <laughs> you know, it's like, ugh, can't be good. Whereas, you know, if you don't tell them even what it is, and you just give it to them. Well, I will say, I was recently in New York, <laughs> and, and for a business purpose, was talking to executives at three of the largest uh, recording companies that record and release <coughs> classical music. And the first two I talked to uh, absolutely said, it's all gone to hell, it's all gone to hell. And then gave me chapter and verse of how it is impossible to make money in this industry. Uh, the third person observed, and I, I, I don't have these numbers in front of me, but observed that um, the sector, the segmentation of classical music on YouTube 
is more robust than any other genre of music. Now, it's not monetized uh, yet, but there are people out there really getting classical music in this new form, and we're just, we musicians are not making any money on it. That's Sorry. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but they're also saying that, the, that uh, rock bands don't make money that way either, but they still put very high production values on what goes out on YouTube. And I think that's one of the mistakes we're making as orchestras is that we're, we're still thinking in the, in the 20, uh, 20th century, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting a finger at, at us, the musicians, because we, we have all these th protections in place as if our recorded material is really valuable right. mo monetarily, and what we ought to be doing is putting that stuff out there and putting our concerts on YouTube, getting the exposure out there with really high production values in order to give more exposure and to get more interest. Now, I have one other uh, subject to propose before we go to questions. Um, and it, it's a tough one, and it puts some of our panelists on the spot. So they are excused from answering my question <laughs> uh, if they don't want to. But uh, we've seen some spectacular problems in the classical music business, in, especially in the past year and two, um, which I could put in, in two filters on. One is boards of organizations dominated by business people uh, with a business orientation uh, towards what should be happening and perhaps very particular tastes in music as well, as, as was alluded to before. Uh, the other is an increasingly confrontational union environment. Um, and in, as, as each organization comes up to their union uh, negotiation, you just know there's going to be blood on the floor. And um, I don't know what you are willing or able to say about this. I have to go first? No. Oh. No, anyone can go. Uh. Concert masters <laughs> never discuss contract negotiations. That's, oh. We just stay away from that because we're, we're usually considered management. So. Oh. Maybe, maybe Don would like to comment. Well, I, um, I'm happy to say something since I don't belong to the union. Um, but about boards, for example, uh, boards of orchestras like boards of universities and lots of other cultural organizations do need to be led and educated in some degree. And I used to get asked on the rubber chicken circuit as a university president, uh, the, the hostile question, well, is the university a business or isn't it? And I would always say, well, of course it's a business. You just have to understand what kind of a business it is. <clears throat> and it's not the kind of business in which you can say, well, profits aren't growing. We're going to get out of toasters and go into financial services. Uh, you are committed to a certain repertory and to maintaining that alive at the highest level. The other thing is that, as I always said at the Mellon Foundation, I would say to the trustees of the Mellon Foundation to remind them from time to time, we only support money-losing businesses here. If they weren't money-losing businesses, they wouldn't need us. So boards of trustees need to understand that too. It's a different kind of a business. It's not profit-oriented. It is and always has been in some degree money-losing, and the lost money is made up with philanthropy and various other things. And we need to demystify or get rid of the whole notion of deficit as this terrible thing that can happen to you. I mean, we have to live within our means, but every season starts with this enormous deficit. Every nickel you raise, every ticket you sell is to help you cover your deficit, right? And so the donor who says, I won't give you any money because I won't cover deficits, well, the very first dollar you get is covering a deficit. So come on, let's all join up here. On the other side, on the union side of it, um, I mean, the musicians have a huge investment in their abilities. They're extraordinarily talented people. We have to, I think, train musicians in a somewhat different way from the way we have traditionally trained them. They need to have somewhat more flexibility and ability to work in what is manifestly a different environment. So, you know, the way I put this is 
I, for one reason or another, used to hang out with orchestras when I was a kid. I used to go to the National Symphony and listen to orchestras all the time. And simultaneously, my father owned a minor league ball club baseball team, and I used to sit in the dugout with minor league baseball players a lot. The musicians and the ball players were a lot alike. They were extremely good at what they did. The biggest bunch of hypochondriacs you ever met, you know, because <laughs> if you're a ball player and your shoulder starts to hurt, you might be finished. And if you're a fiddle player and your shoulder start, starts to hurt, you might be finished. Um, but they didn't worry about anything except how good they were at doing their thing. And what they thought about when they weren't playing, either baseball or music, you didn't worry about. You didn't care if they knew the dates of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, really, <laughs> as long as they played like angels, right? right? right. Uh, well, to speak that to was the... a long time ago, and that won't work. You need, and you need teachers who do more than say, kid, this is how you're supposed to play this piece. <laughs> well, to speak to the whole, I mean, that actually, I mean, my, my take on the union as a union member is that in the way it was formed and it got really, really strong back in the day when musicians really did need some protection of some sort because you had music directors who on a bad day <laughs> didn't like the way you look, could just fire you. And so the union got stronger and stronger. I mean, unions across the country got stronger and stronger during that time, right? And now, I mean, like you said, that we are fragile people who need some protection but at the same time, um, you know, our jobs is to play to, it's like to, to play to the highest possible level, right? So I'm in the Chicago Symphony. I feel like the Chicago Symphony has a standard. And it is our job as each and every musician in the Chicago Symphony to play at least in that level, if not higher, right? Even if you're having a bad day, it should at least fall in this range because that is what the audience expects, that's what your colleagues expect, and that's what the donors are giving money for, is the standard of the Chicago Symphony. Um, and where the union kind of comes in sometimes against us and why management might not like us is that because the union has gotten so strong, we end up protecting people that have finally fallen through the cracks and maybe perhaps not, you know, at the level that they once were or this, that, or the other thing. And that is something that we fight every day because it's kind of, we're sometimes being hypocrites by saying, no, we deserve this, 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 and this. Every one of us in the Chicago Symphony should get this when not every single one of us are, I don't want to say deserving, but are playing at the level that the CSO standard ought to be. Hmm. Well, this should be taken to mean that organized labor is a bad thing. You know, it's very easy to badmouth unions in this country, and it is simply not true that we didn't need organized labor to be very powerful at a certain point in our history. Um, we have some time for comments or questions, and if you have them, uh, because we're recording this session, uh, it's, it's very important if you would be willing to come over to this microphone because if you just shout out your comment, we uh, <clears throat> won't get it on tape. So please feel free to uh, come on up. There was an article <clears throat> two or three days ago about the, the problems that the New York Met is having and whether they might have to file for bankruptcy in two or three years. And what is the solution there? Are $200,000 salaries for a chorus and orchestra reasonable salaries, or have, because of costs in New York, just pushed things just so high it's uh, not manageable? Well, it's, um, let me speak in behalf of musicians at the level of the Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, maybe I won't speak for every last member of the chorus of the, of the, uh, of the Metropolitan Opera, but if you're, the timpanist choosing a thing at random, <laughs> or the oboist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, you're one of the, let's be generous, 12 best people at that in the world. Maybe it's two dozen, right? Um, so it comes down to the value that we place on certain kinds of talent in our society. 
every law firm of any consequence hires people straight out of law school. They know they don't know how to be a lawyer yet. They've got to take four years to teach them to be a lawyer, and their starting salary is higher than the timpanist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, who's put a lifetime into being able to do this at the very highest level. So um, it's, <clears throat> you know, it's about values. I mean, I'm always saying it's not the value proposition, it's the values proposition when we talk about arts and culture. Of course we need to manage costs. Of course there are cases where people are perhaps paid more than they need to be paid. Um, I myself have troubles with some of the productions at the Metropolitan Opera, and I might as well say it out loud, Peter Gelb got very angry with me because I didn't give him any more money after my first year at Mellon Foundation, and, and I said, you know, these productions are, some of them, just crazily too expensive. Right, so the Met, I mean, <coughs> certainly their labor costs are great, but their labor costs have not gone up in the same proportion as their production costs have in the past 10 years. So, so the labor is not the whole answer to what has to be fixed there. Hi, Howard Gardner, classical music fan. <clears throat> I'm interested in, in the defunding and the new funding for orchestras. Um, Don Randall mentioned that the other major foundations stopped funding classical music. I wondered why, and does it have something to do with new board membership and their values? And then the other side of the coin, if we talk about the new wealth and the young wealth, is are the arts as a whole toxic, or is it focused particularly on, on, on classical music? And if it's a rock and roll um, museum, then, then there's no problem. Um, a couple of things to say about that, to start with the last point first. <clears throat> The new wealth relation to music and to the arts generally is a function in part of the fact that music has never been a good hedge against inflation. That is to say, you can't buy it and hang it on your wall and then sell it 10 years later and make a lot of money out of it. So the, 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 rate, the ways in which a lot of people get interested in the visual and plastic arts has to do, I think, with its value over time. Um, but uh, the defunding uh, in major foundations and in a lot of new foundations being created has to do often with a kind of entrepreneurial spirit in which people built a business that solved one really important problem or created one fantastic product or family of products which then took off. And so when they give money away, they want to give it to an institution that is going to accomplish some specific thing. It's going to cure disease X, or it's going to solve social problem Y, and they want to have it measured at the end of the day, did we do that or didn't we, and so forth. Whereas the symphony orchestra, how do you, how do you measure that? How are you going to judge the impact and the assessment and so forth and so on? I mean, you, we love this music and we do it because we can't not do it. Uh, and it's not because you can say someday, well, we solved the music problem and so we can now do something else. Hi, um, I'm curious as to what the ratio is like between older musicians who are retiring and uh, newer musicians who are just coming out of like universities uh, into the orchestras. And if those rates are unequal, what that means for the future of music in the next decade or so. Well, I'll take that first because we have gone through an amazing transition in St. Louis to a very young orchestra. I feel really old, actually. My the entire first violin section, I think, there are only two other people that are over 50, and the rest of them are mostly under 30. And, um, and I think it's partly, and I, I see it happening across the orchestra, and I think it's part, partly due to orchestras tended to form at, at a certain time in history, and then generationally, those, those people were of similar age, so they all tend to retire at a similar age, and there's a few in, interspersed in between, but. Uh, the number of years ago, we had 15 people retire in one year, and then for years we'll go where there's no one retiring. And um, and I saw, but I think that if you looked at at a St. Louis Symphony concert, you say, oh, that's this is it's all young people. And um, and I, I don't know in, in Chicago if it's you, you probably see a trend there too, right? Yeah, I mean, well, most of the positions that we fill recently are all the string players are like literally 24, 25, 
25. But there's no shortage for people coming out of school wanting a job because still like 180 people will show up for one position. Yeah, like New York Philharmonic just advertised five violin positions. Uh, and uh, there's, I would say any given year, there's probably 30, 30 to 40 positions in the United States for violin. For percussion, it could be zero to like four or five. And I mean, some of these four or fives, we're talking like salaries that are like $25,000 a year. Smaller orchestras that like two years later, it folds. I will say, because it, I, I, I hope it's germane to your question, although it would be a whole other panel. Um, we hosted at the music festival uh, a meeting of the independent conservatory presidents uh, this week. So Juilliard, Curtis, uh, Cleveland Institute, the Colburn School, et cetera. There are eight of them. And Don Randall was the, the facilitator for that meeting. And we, we talked, because one always does, about the immense number of hugely talented musicians that were graduating from our programs. We have 630 <coughs> students from 43 countries every summer in Aspen. Um, and one thing it comes down to is either one believes that the education of a musician at the highest level is a useful form of liberal education. So these people are being well served by what they do, whether or not they get an, the exact oboe job they thought they wanted, um, or, then, or there's a huge problem. Because if you think conservatory training is vocational training, and thus it fails if you don't give them a job in that vocation, then that's the problem. But if you're a philosophy major at a liberal arts college, you don't say, my education was useless because I didn't get a job as a philosopher. Um, anyway, that's an issue. My wife and I have been uh, season ticket holders of the San Francisco Symphony for uh, more than 40 years. And we see the same people today that we were seeing 40 years ago. And we, we don't call them graying, we call them the disappearing because they're, they, 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 they go on. And we're not seeing young people. And, and I appreciate the, the, the reference to the programs for younger people now, but they're not coming along as quickly as the audiences, at least in San Francisco, are disappearing. We unfortunately um, don't have the benefits that, uh, the, that LA has and that, that Boston has with, with, with their summer programs. Um, but I'm, I'm curious where we're going to be, where, where San Francisco is going to be in five or 10 years with, without the next generation or two generations down coming along and being, and being at the symphony. Well, I, I would say uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to San Diego Opera in this as well, and, and it unfortunately it has a corollary to the Met in New York, that uh, if you say we can't continue doing exactly what we've always done the way we've always done it, it's not working financially, therefore we should fold. Um, as opposed to saying our business model has some structural flaw in it, so what can we do differently? that wouldn't have that same flaw. And uh, in San Diego, uh, first one set of people said, we've got to close. And then luckily, another set of people said, no, let's give this a shot. Uh, let's do it differently. Let's borrow productions. Let's hire in a different way. Let's produce in a different way. Um, so I, I think that may have to happen to our orchestras as well. Um, I thought. Of all places like San Francisco, with like Silicon Valley right there, that they could just build some space and just pi literally do, literally sequester that audience down at Google office and like pump in classical music and do it like <laughs> digital video things where you know you've got the pan, the cameras on all of us, and you just stick it in a room and it's playing and people go in there and I don't know. You know, at first maybe it would be for free and it would be mandatory, not mandatory, 
company time, but it, it would be playing in one room and I don't know, maybe Google employees would get into it. Because I feel like younger people these days is so like, what's the trend? And it, it catches on if it just catches. Well, people think of San Francisco as being a very wealthy city because of the tech industry. And yeah. it's, it's Silicon Valley is really moving into San Francisco. Mm. But these are people who just haven't formed an interest in some of the some of the culture. Now there, there are some people there that are involved in 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 the, in the ballet and the symphony and, oh. and and the opera, but not very much relative to the wealth that they have. But remember, uh, 25 years ago or maybe 30 years ago, Bill Gates was reviled in philanthropy because he was doing nothing, and now look at at, at what he's doing for the world. Yeah. So, but it take it takes a while and and. We are at a loss to figure out how to, how to move it up. I think he's a good example of this style of philanthropy that says, OK, if I want to eradicate malaria in Africa that kills millions of children, I can buy a mosquito net for 10 bucks, and that will, you can then see the numbers go down. So you can spend a finite amount of money to buy a finite number of mosquito nets, and you will be able to graph the decline in deaths of malaria. And that's what's satisfying to a guy like Bill Gates. I think he has solved the problem with his money. And you just can't make that analogy so easily with the symphony orchestra or another cultural organization, which requires long-term support and is a slowly evolving kind of thing. And you can't just declare victory and walk away. You know, um, and I've, there were years in St. Louis, and I've, like, since I've been there 25 years now, I, um, I've seen the same thing occur, and one of the, the things that disturbs me most is when uh, a, a married couple that I've gotten to know over the years had dinner with, met them after concerts, they come backstage, they lose one of the spouses. Well, very often, the other spouse will not want to come to the symphony anymore because they're alone. And, um, but, and, and that happens, and then I look up and, and I can see the boxes. I know where everybody sits. I see those empty seats up there, and I go, you know, she's not coming because he passed away last year. And, um, and what we do as an orchestra, as our development office oftentimes is trying to get people to go with somebody or put two people together when they've lost their spouses. And that sometimes works. But, the, 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 uh, but what I've also seen, and just to answer your question, is I have seen those seats get sold to another couple. And I have seen them become involved in the orchestra and supporting the orchestra even though they're in their 50s. And it usually is. It doesn't. It's very often after the kids are grown that I see that, see it happening. It's uh, there. It's usually their kids are away at college. They suddenly start to take an interest in the orchestra. And I do think that those people come. They do come along. But you have to do it one family or one seat at a time. And it's a lot. It's a lot. Now I really want to hear more comments, but I'm looking to our institute uh, staff because we are past our time limit. You're a riot out there. And there's probably a malaria conference <laughs> set to happen in here. Um, I don't know. Let's search for more questions. OK. OK, mine's, mine's pretty quick. Um, I just wanted to voice a thank you to all of you and the extended um, community for your support in the educational music program. I have two kids in the public schools um, down Valley who are benefiting from the foundations up here. And my question is to any of you or all of you, but um, specifically Cynthia, um, what would you say to, what would your advice be or what would you say to a youth who is about to leave school um, who wants to play music but is in a, a situation where the world says you can't do that for a living. You shouldn't follow your dream because it's not practical. Um, you should find something else that will do to sustain you. Sorry. I mean, believe it or not, I was told that. And actually, I, my first year of university was in business because I was told, because you know, I came from a piano background, and I was just told, hey, Cynthia, do you want to be like 
piano teacher teaching little kids? Right. Or do you want a real job like running, a, you know, be successful? I'm like, well, I want to be successful. Okay, well then why don't you do piano on the side and go to business school? I'm like, oh, okay. So I did. And um, I loved it until I hated it. And I didn't hate it because I didn't like the stuff I was learning. I hated it because for me, for music, you can't just walk away from playing, kind of go, all right, let's, um, maybe I'll come back to it after I get my business degree. It was one of those things where while I was during, during my first semester, I was thinking, you know, I really miss piano and that is something that I cannot go back to as a performer. But I will always have my brain to go back to school and get my business degree. So I made a deal with myself that I switched over and became a piano performance major in my second year. Before then I switched over to be a percussion major. But by the time I switched over to percussion, I made a deal to myself that if by the time I'm 30 years old and I don't have a job, I'm going back to school for something. But at least I would have really tried for this dream that I had. But I'm, I will also be realistic at the same time and not going to chase this dream if I'm 30 and jobless and freelancing and poor. I, that is not the lifestyle I want. So then, by then I would have said to myself, you know what, I'm going back to school, getting my business degree and getting a real job. And luckily for me, it didn't come to that. But I think if it's absolutely something you can't live without, you can't live without it. So to try it and to really, really pursue it, but in the back of your mind knowing that in case it doesn't work out, I'm okay giving it up. I'm okay just going to concerts. Same thing I tell my son who's 17 and he's very talented, but he, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have this absolute need to be a musician. So I'm, I would, I'm not telling him to do that. I want him to go into the sciences because that's what he loves. But if, I had a, if my son told me, I want to play the cello for a li living, let's follow that dream. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise until, you, until you've searched, researched that. I, that's what I did. I was completely naive. I had no idea how hard it was to get a job in the music business. Mm -hmm. And you know, it worked out just fine. But, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I would just encourage him. I have another case like that, namely a daughter who when she graduated uh, from college, she had studied the literature major at Yale, but the, all of her four years she was studying the tuba with the tuba teacher in the Graduate School of Music. So came time to graduate and she says to me, well, Dad, you know, I, I would really like to take a fling at being a tuba player. And so she came to Aspen in the summers a couple of times. She knocked around the country studying with the great tuba teacher one at Michigan. She studied with a guy in Georgia who was great at the time. And finally she figured out that there were really only 12 good tuba jobs in the whole country. <laughs> and at that time not one of them was held by a woman. So she went to Harvard and got a PhD in music history and she lived happily ever after. So you do have to have some escape routes in life no matter what your plan is. Life is, sooner or later, life is ultimately a pile of accidents, you know. <laughs> I guess I'm the last question, and it is on the future of the symphony. There was an opera that was slated to be given fairly recently, and they were going to do digital music and not have an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And it was beaten back in the orchestra. They said, no, we want an orchestra. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how is the orchestra going to compete with this? Are they going to change programs? What's the future? Well, this was the, the thing in Hartford, uh, Connecticut. And um, I guess we were all agreeing uh, that it's just an, an atrocious idea because it's as if the singing is one thing and the orchestra is another thing. And in an opera, that is not the case. It's all one thing. And uh, you might as well listen to a recording of the whole thing as listen to a recording of the orchestra and live singers. I think that's not going to happen, what you referred to there. But there are other parts of the music world where 
technology is reducing the number of musicians required. So if you go to a Broadway show these days, instead of an orchestra with a big string section and half a dozen brass players and so forth and so on, you'll see six guys up there, two of them playing electronic keyboards, and there'll be a drummer for sure, and maybe one or two wind players. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you.